let's go. Okay, so today our mathematician spotlight is Ralph Gomez. He is an associate professor in the Swarthmore College Math Department, and he studies differential geometry. So lucky for us, there was an uh, interview with Professor Gomez in the Swarthmore paper last fall. Did any of you read it? Yeah? Good. Okay. So I'll just tell you what he said about what he studies and his path in math. So he said, differential geometry, roughly speaking, is a mathematical apparatus which uses vast generalizations of calculus, calculus, that's why we're here, to better understand the shape, size, and curvature of a space in any dimension of interest. So not necessarily R2, R3, no, any dimension. Okay. One of the most fruitful things that comes out of differential geometry is the notion of the curvature of a space. What do I mean by the curvature of the space? You agree that the surface of a basketball will be a different kind of curvature than a sheet of paper. Well, how do you mathematically talk about the curvature of the space? It was really Gauss who first figured out the correct mathematical approach to talk about the curvature of a two-dimensional surface. And it turns out that you can talk about the curvature of the space from a purely intrinsic point of view, i.e. without reference to an ambient space. So it doesn't matter if it's in R2 or R3 or what. This was one of Gauss's many great breakthroughs a few centuries about, ago. Okay, then he talks about generalized geometry, which is something that he's working on with another professor at Swarthmore, Janet uh, Talvakia. Do any of you know Janet Talvakia? Yeah, she's on leave this year, but you might have known her last year, or you might know her next year. So he gives a really nice example of this. So he says, imagine we lived in a world in which the only interesting thing was the line y equals 5x. Suppose someone was doing math research on the line y equals 5x. Maybe one breakthrough was that they found out the slope of this line was 5. And maybe another breakthrough was that it makes a certain angle with the x-axis. Then, maybe a couple decades later, someone is able to study the line y equals negative x. They find out that the slope of the line is negative 1, and that it makes a certain slope with the x-axis, and so on. So here you have someone studying the line y equals 5x, and someone studying the line y equals negative x. It would be interesting if someone came along and said, hey, let's consider the line y equals mx, or y equals mx plus b. That takes into account not only the line that you had been studying, y equals 5x, but also the other line, y equals negative x. Those are all manifestations of the same enterprise, y equals mx, or y equals mx plus b. And that's kind of what generalized ge geometry has done. It says there are many geometric structures out there, but they're all manifestations of the same underlying geometric framework. Namely, generalized geometric things. So that's pretty cool. We're actually going to use that idea, the one about 5x and negative x, in next class. Now, he also talks about his path to math. So they ask him, how did you develop an interest in math, and how did you end up doing what you do? And he said, it's definitely been a windy road. The standard thing is that people think that since I'm a mathematician, I must have been good at math from the very beginning, but that's definitely not true with me. In fact, I didn't even plan on going to college. No one in my family went to college. My oldest brother was in and out of jail, and my other ma brother made a collection of bad decisions, which prevented him from leading a responsible life as well. What's more, I lived in a neighborhood where gangs were prominent. The idea of going to college wasn't something I really thought about, and it was not talked about at home either. It was a concept you only saw on TV. Although I did take college prep classes in high school, I didn't imagine myself going to college. In fact, I think in my sophomore year of high school, I actually thought about joining the gang that was living in my neighborhood called the 14ers. At the time, I actually wanted to be in their gang, but there are a couple of reasons why I decided not to take that route. And the first was skateboarding. Skateboarding actually deterred me from wanting to be a gangster. And the second is this. I remember when I was eight or nine, going with my mom and sister every other Saturday to the county jail to visit my oldest brother who was incarcerated there. One of the things that made a profound impression on me was seeing the severe disappointment in my mom's face from having to see her son in jail. I remember thinking to myself, because the poor choices made by my brothers cause immense heartache for my mom, I should therefore do the opposite of what my brothers do and not be a bad kid. That is, I shouldn't break the law and I should stay out of jail. And then he talks about being in skateboarding, deciding to go to college. He says, I couldn't go to the fancy community college, which was maybe 30 minutes away from my house because my family could afford the gas. So I had to go to the small community college a couple blocks from the house, which allowed me to walk there. He says he started in trigonometry and then did pre-calculus and uh, decided to, to do math. Um, finally, 
Finally, he entered a, a math PhD program several years later. I'm skipping some bits. He said, the, summer, the first semester I arrived at the University of Mexico to start the PhD program, my dad passed away. Before he passed away, he made me give him a deathbed promise that I would not let his death interrupt my schooling. I was about to drop out of the PhD program and head back home to help out with my family because of various things that happened as a result of his death. But I made the promise and stayed in the PhD program and picked up the PhD after five and a half years. One of the crucial things that happened while studying for my PhD is that my advisor, Charles P. Boyer, showed that he believed I was capable of being a mathematician by giving me a research grant. The fact that a professional and su successful mathematician believed in me and wanted to see me succeed really meant the world to me. That really was a turning point. I really immersed myself in mathematics like I had never done before after that. And here he is today, associate professor, tenured in the Swarthmore Math Department. It's, an, it's a really great interview. I did not read you the whole thing, but it's online, and you can also take this one and read it if you like. So that's Professor Gomez. Um, I taught Math 15 with him last semester, um, and he's wonderful. So there you go. Um, I guess one thing to say there is that um, it really makes a big difference when someone takes an interest in you and just gives you a little push in some direction. And that's something that I have tried to do with students. So if you need a push, come to my office. I will for sure give you a push. So, good. So, um, let's see, last time we talked about uh, different coordinate systems, cylindrical and spherical coordinates and graphing surfaces. Today we're gonna graph surfaces also. So, we're, um, yeah, so I'll start with a little, a little review and then push it forward as we've been doing. So, in two dimensions, Suppose you're, so, well, two dimensions, you can use two variables, x and y. And suppose that you're allowing yourself to go up to total degree two. So you could have an x squared, or you can have a y squared, or you can have an x times y. All the equations you could get can be summarized by things like a times x squared plus b times xy plus c times y squared plus d times x plus e times y plus f equals zero. So there you've got your constant, your linear terms in x and y, and then your three degree two terms. Okay, so let's talk about all the things that you can get. There are, I think, five different kinds of things you can get. I'll say the first one. So the first one you can get is you can certainly get lines. Because if you let all of these second degree terms be zero, then you have a linear of x plus a linear of y equals a constant. So that's a line. Can anyone think of a different kind of a curve that you could get? from this? Yeah. Parabolas. Yeah, you can get parabolas. Yeah, right. Yeah, like for example, if you just have ax squared, what, equals ey, then you would get a parabola. Cool. Nice. Yeah. You can get a circle? You can get a circle. Yeah, if, if the coefficients a and c are the same, and your f term is negative, you would get a circle. Nice. Yeah, another one? Yeah. Uh, hyperbola, yeah. Nice, hyperbola. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. If you have, what, opposite coefficients on your x squared and your y squared, and a non-zero constant term, you get a hyperbola. Nice. OK, one more. Yeah. Yeah, you can get ellipses. So a generalization of circle is ellipses. OK. So though I think those are the five things that you can get of this form. So there you have it. OK. So now that we are comfortable with two dimensions, let's push on into three dimensions as we've been doing. So in 3D, uh, let's say you allowed yourself to three variables, x, y, and z. And you allowed yourself to go up to total degree 2. So you'd have things like ax squared plus by squared plus cz squared. OK, those are all the squared terms. Plus dxy plus exz plus fyz. And then plus all the constant terms. So plus gx plus hy plus iz plus j equals 0. OK, so there's some, everything would be of that form. And man, if we were going to try to just understand these, it would be really tough. So the idea, the big idea that we're going to use today is to set each variable equal to a constant. 
so maybe x equals a constant, y equals a constant, or z equals a constant. That takes one, one variable out of there completely and reduces it back to the two-dimensional case. So this uh, removes one variable, that variable, and reduces back to the two-dimensional case that we understand. And what this means, set a variable equal to a constant, is taking a slice. So for example, if we set z equal to 0, it's slicing our surface with the xy plane. And then we would just get a curve in 2D, which is the intersection of our plane with our surface. And so then we look at slices and sort of put them together in our mind to understand the surface. So that's the plan of today. We're going to look at different equations of this form and then slice them with constants to see what happens. Yeah? Are we going to be doing a similar thing as we were doing with level curves? Yes. Yep. The same idea as level curves. Exactly. Just understand what they look like and, put, and sort of stack the level curves. But now level curves not only slicing with horizontal plane with z, but also slicing with vertical planes with x and with y. So it should give us a bit more information. Yeah, good question. OK, let's begin. OK, so the first one we'll look at is one that we have seen before. So z equals x squared minus y squared. Good. So we'll look at setting various things equal to a constant. So let's set z equal to a constant, and then we'll set x equal to a constant, and then we'll set y equal to a constant. So if z equals a constant, then we have k equals x squared minus y squared, which is <coughs> hyperbola. Yeah, nice, which is hyperbola. So this gives you some hyperbola. So this tells you if you slice it with any horizontal plane, you're going to get a hyperbola. Different hyperbolas, but hyperbolas. If x equals a constant, then we get z equals that constant squared minus y squared. So z equals negative y squared is a downward parabola. And then this k squared just moves it up and down. So this is like down parabolas. And then similarly, if y is a constant, we get z equals x squared minus your constant squared. So z equals x squared is an upward facing parabola. And this minus k squared just brings it down. So this is an upward facing parabola. So what this tells us is that if you slice with horizontal cross sections, you get hyperbolas. And if you slice with vertical cross sections in either direction, you get parabolas. So we kind of have to figure out what that looks like. You have to take this information and put it together and figure out what sort of thing you would get. We've seen this before. Um, it looks like, well, the way I like to draw it is, let's start with an upward facing parabola. So here it is. And then from each place, hang a downward facing parabola from it. So something like that. And then you get a, a sort of a sense of what the surface looks like. You could have, just is the same, started with a downward facing parabola, maybe a nice wide one to help you out, and hung a bunch of upward facing parabolas from it. That would have been OK, too. It would come out the same. Um, and if you want to emphasize that there are also horizontal cross sections that are hyperbolas, you can draw in a few of those. Maybe some up here. And then there's also the ones in the front, the one in, down here that cuts through the front and the back. Um, there's somewhat of an art to drawing surfaces like this, because if you try to put all the information you know about it all in the picture at once, it will be a mess. Um, so for example, I draw dotted lines for the things in the back so that they look like they're further away, that sort of thing. Probably the first time that you draw one, it's not going to look very good. But try, just try, not, draw another one. Um, Maybe delete some of the information. 
don't put it all on there and see what you need in order to see what it looks like. Um, of course, I could have drawn the whole thing just drawing hyperbolas, but that seems more difficult. Yeah, questions or ideas? Okay, so we press on to somewhere we have not been before. Ah, yes. I wanted to say here, um, I did not put, I just made z equals x squared minus y squared. But I could have divided by some constants or multiplied by constants. So we could have had some constant times z, x squared divided by some constant or multiplied by some constant, and the same with y squared. It wouldn't have changed the actual shape of the thing. It would have just compressed it in one of the directions, stretched or compressed it. So it doesn't change the really what the surface is like. It just changes what it looks like. Okay. So how about the next one? So the next one we will do is um, uh, x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals 1. Um, or we could divide by some constants here. But we want to know what this thing looks like. So let's take some cross sections. So for instance, uh, cross sections at x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, and then maybe some other constants later. Okay? So if x equals 0, then we get uh, essentially y squared plus z squared equals 1. Can anyone say what that describes? Yeah, an ellipse or a circle. An ellipse if I have constants under here. Um, and a circle if not. So, so let's say in general an ellipse. Nice. Similarly, if y equals 0, I get x squared plus c squared equals 1, which is generally an ellipse. Um, and then if z equals 0, I get x squared plus y squared equals 1, which is also an ellipse. So the cross sections, if you slice it with any of the coordinate planes, are ellipses. So um, this thing looks like ellipses in all the directions. So it looks like like this. Okay, so in the plane of the board, we get an ellipse. Then in the vertical plane, uh, perpendicular to the board, we also get an ellipse. And then in the horizontal plane, we also get an ellipse. So it looks something like that. It's like an ellipse that you then spun, maybe, if it's circular in one of the directions. But it's uh, maybe an ellipse in all three ways. This is called an ellipsoid because it's ellipses all the way around. And now I remember that I did not say what this is called. So the uh, cross sections in some directions are hyperbolas. So it's called a hyperbolic. And then in the other directions are parabolas. So paraboloid. So this is a hyperbolic paraboloid because it's made of hyperbolas and parabolas. And this guy is an ellipsoid and ellipsoid because it's got ellipses all the way around. Okay, now I have two follow-up questions about this. So what if we sliced it with the plane z, uh, sorry, x equals a? So assuming that our equation is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared plus z squared over c squared equals 1, what if we slice it with x equals a? Can you see what the solutions would look like? Yeah, anyone? Yeah? Y squared squared plus c squared over c squared equals 1 minus 1 over a. Yeah, so if x is a, then we get a squared over a squared here, which is 1. Okay, yeah, so then we would get y squared over b squared plus z squared over c squared equals 0. Can you figure out the solutions to that? Yeah, only 0, yeah. We essentially get like x squared, sorry. Uh, y squared plus z squared equals 0, maybe over some constants, but it doesn't really matter, um, because there's no solutions to that except 0. So we get a, 0, 0. That's just one point as a solution. So it tells you that with some plane out here, x equals a, we would get just a single point. And that's right here. That's if we slice right here, we get this single point here, a, 0, 0. And the same thing if we, if I had asked you x equals negative a, we would square it so everything would be the same. We would just get the single point negative a, 0, 0, which is over here. 
Okay. How about x equals 2a? What if we slice it with a plane x equals 2a? What would we get? Yeah. Why wouldn't we get anything? Because it's outside of the ellipse. Yeah, right. So if a was here and 0 is here at the middle, geometrically, if we slice it with x equals 2a, you're outside, so you shouldn't get anything. Nice. And algebraically, so all right here, no solutions. No solutions. Algebraically, if I put in 2a for x, I would square it and get 4a squared. 4a squared over a squared is 4. So I get 4 plus something plus something equals 1. And this something here is always um, non-negative. So 4 plus something non-negative is 1. There's no solutions to that. So there's no solutions, which tells you that out here there's nothing. Same analysis for negative 2a, and the same thing if we had picked like y equals 2b or negative 2b, and so on. That would have been out here. So it tells you that there are some places where you can slice this thing and it doesn't hit your surface at all. And that's a useful piece of information to have. Yeah. It's sort of like, um, there's this game called Guess Who? Did you ever play it? It's got, it's like you, you and your partner, your co-player, each have the, a bunch of people. And these people have all sorts of different characteristics. Like some of them have curly hair, or straight hair, or glasses, or no glasses, or a mustache, or no mustache, or dark skin, or light skin, or blue eyes, or brown eyes, or whatever, okay? And you say, and you pick a person, and they pick a person. And then you say, does your person have a mustache? And they say, no. And so then you, you cross off all the people that have a mustache. And then you say, does your person have a hat on? And they say, yes. And so you cross off all the people that don't have a hat on or whatever. It's sort of like that. You want to sort of probe this for all the things. Like, well, what about cross section in this direction? Are they ellipses? Yes, they are. What if I slice it with this plane? Do I get anything? No, you don't. It sort of gives you hints about what the surface looks like. And then your job is to put all that together and say, oh, I see, it must be Tarzan. He is not wearing a hat, and he's wearing glasses, and he doesn't have a mustache, whatever. Put it all together. And here it would be to say, oh, all the cross sections are ellipses, and there are places where it doesn't intersect, so it must be an ellipsoid. Something like that. There's no, there's no obvious way to go about it. You just have to try it a bunch of times and sort of see what works for you. That's the, that's the idea. OK, let's try it with another friend. So our new friend is x squared plus y squared. So c equals x squared plus y squared. So again, suppose we try x equals 0, y equals 0, and z equals 0, and see what we get. If x equals 0, then we get z equals y squared, which is an upward parabola. If we do y equals 0, z equals x squared, again, an upward parabola. And if z equals 0, we get 0 equals x squared plus y squared. Solutions to this? 0, just 0, yeah. The only just one point, 0, 0, 0. Cool, OK. Um, how about if z, so this is sort of interesting, we get a single point. Maybe that means that cross sections with z equal to a constant are interesting. So let's try some other things. What if z is greater than 0? So then we have uh, something positive equals x squared plus y squared. These things? Circles, yeah, circles or ellipses. So let's say in general if this could be over some constants, uh, in general, this, these would be ellipses. And how about if z is negative? Then we have some negative number equals x squared plus y squared. Doesn't exist. Yeah, no solutions. So this tells us something interesting. OK, it tells you that if you have z equals 0, so here's the plane z equals 0, you get a single point. If you're above with z positive, you get ellipses as your cross sections. And the bigger z is, the bigger the ellipses are. On the other hand, if z is negative, you get nothing. So down here, there's nothing. OK? And then our other information is that cross sections 
um, are upward facing parabolas. So we should get some upward facing parabolas up here. Um, and then how about like, what if x is some constant? Then we get z equals constant squared plus y squared. Um, this is an upwards parabola, but shifted up. So what we get here is something whose cross sections are all parabolas in the vertical direction, and then whose horizontal slices are ellipses. So it looks sort of like, sort of like a bowl. So, and then if we slice it with some other plane, not through the origin, we get upward facing parabolas but shifted up. So those are these. So, yeah. Both of these shapes are kind of centered at the origin. Yeah. Is it possible to move these objects? Sure, yeah, you can move them. So this is where we get the other like linear terms. You could take something like, so the question was, these are all centered at the origin. What, what happens if you shift them around? So yeah, if you had something like z equals x minus 3 squared plus y plus 2 squared, it would be the same kind of shape. But we would get some more constant terms and some linear terms in there for multiplying these things up. Yep. Good question. Yep. Cool. So this is called um, a paraboloid. Because all of its cross sections are parabolas, except the horizontal ones, which are ellipses. Yeah. It's sort of like if you take a parabola, a regular parabola like y equals x squared that we know, and you spin it around. You get this kind of thing. Except the cross sections might not be circles, they might be ellipses. So you might take that spun thing and then just sort of smush it. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah. Yeah. If it was a parabola and you spun it, yeah. then you would get a circle, right? Right. As if you do something else, then you get ellipses. That's right, yeah. If it was a parabola and you spun it, the cross sections would all be circles. So you can't get an elliptical paraboloid by the spinning method. So I guess in general, this is called an elliptical paraboloid. Yeah. Right. You can think of it as like a bowl whose sides get steeper and steeper as you go up. Nice. All right. OK. So here we have just considered a, a couple of different families of these things. And now um, we'll consider a, a family of the same kinds of equations and see what happens for different members of the family. OK. So. OK. OK. So let's consider the family of surfaces of the form z squared equals x squared plus y squared plus or minus k. So this constant here is what's going to make our family members different. So we'll consider um, k, first k equals 0, k greater than 0, and k less than 0. And we'll see what kind of a surface we get for each of those types of values of k. That's, that's, the, that's the plan. OK, so first let's consider if k equals 0. So then we have uh, z squared equals x squared plus y squared. OK, let's try to figure out what this thing looks like. So our usual strategy, um, set x equal to 0, set y equal to 0, set z equal to 0. If we set x equal to 0, we get z squared equals y squared. So taking the square root of both sides, this tells us that z equals plus or minus y. So that's sort of like the line z equals y and the line z equals negative y together. So it's sort of like an x. How about y equals 0? Then we have z squared equals x squared. So we get z equals plus or minus x which again is like the two lines making an x shape. So again, this x shape. And how about if z equals 0? Then we get 0 equals x squared plus
plus y squared. So, just one solution. x and y both have to be 0. So the single point, 0, 0, 0. So what we found so far is if we slice this thing vertically, we get an x in this direction. We slice vertically in the other direction, we get an x in that direction. And if we slice with the xy plane z equals 0, we get just one point. So this gives us a lot of information about what it could be. OK, good. We might want to try just a few more. You might already know what it looks like. So you might think maybe it's a whatever you're thinking. And then you might want to check just a few more things to make sure. So what if, for example, um, what if x is equal to a constant? I'll, I usually use k for a constant. But because I use k for the big constant, I'll use a different letter for the constant. So if x is a constant, then we get z squared equals c squared plus y squared. And these are, you said at the beginning, I believe, hyperbolas. Yeah? OK. I think I made a mistake on the sheet and said they were parabolas. They are not. They are hyperbolas. So these are hyperbolas. So this tells you that if you slice it in the vertical direction, you get hyperbolas. And similarly, for y equals c, you get z squared equals x squared plus c squared, which is also hyperbolas. And then how about if y, uh, z equals to a constant? Then we get c squared equals x squared plus y squared, which is a circle, or in general, if we have constants in here, in general, an ellipse. So putting all this information together, if you slice it with vertical planes through the origin, you get um, x's. But if you move a little bit away, you get hyperbolas. Horizontal slice right through um, the origin gives you just one point. But other horizontal slices give you ellipses or circles. Putting it together, we can see you would get, let's see. Um, a double cone. That's the idea. So if we slice through the origin, we get these x's. Um, if we slice horizontally, we just get this one point. Um, and then if you do these other slices, you get hyperbola. So for instance, this hyperbola, or this hyperbola on the other side, um, and then if you slice it horizontally, you get ellipses. So we get a cone, maybe an elliptical cone, if it's not circular. Yeah. The vertical slices are hyperbolas? Yep. Vertical slices are hyperbolas. Yep. 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 Good. OK. So there are two more members to our family. One is if k is bigger than 0. And one is if k is less than 0. OK, so the second thing we'd like to consider is if k is greater than 0. So then we have something of the form z squared equals x squared plus y squared plus k. And we're taking k to be a positive number here, so something's actually added. So again, let's do x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. If x is 0, we get z squared equals y squared plus k, which is also hyperbolas. Um, y equals 0, same deal. z squared equals x squared plus k, hyperbolas. If z equals 0, we get 0 equals x squared plus y squared plus k. Here, k is a positive constant. so. No solutions. No solutions. Not possible to make x squared plus y squared into a negative number. So no solutions. So this is a big piece of evidence. This is a great thing for us to know. This means if we slice this thing with the xy plane, it doesn't touch our surface at all. That's a pretty good thing to know. So maybe more, more information is needed. Maybe we should say, OK, z equals 0, we get no solutions. But what about other z's? So how about if z is some other constant? So then we get c squared, I'll say minus k, equals x squared plus y squared. So 
if c squared is greater than k, then this left side would be positive. So we could get um, ellipses. And if c squared is less than k, then, again, then this left side is still no solutions. Then the left, left, left side is still negative, so there's still no solutions. And let's just slice it with a plane x equals k. So then we would get what? z squared equals, sorry, I'll use a different constant, c. Uh, c squared plus y squared plus k. Um, c squared plus k is, again, just a constant. So these are hyperbolas. OK, so our evidence says that when you slice vertically, you get hyperbolas. And when you slice horizontally, there are some places where you get nothing when your constant is close to 0. But then when your constant is big enough, then you start getting ellipses. So putting this together, we can draw something. So all of our vertical cross sections are hyperbolas. Hyperbolas. So something like this. Um, and our horizontal cross sections are ellipses. But sometimes empty. So this whole part in here, there's nothing. Our surface isn't there. So it's not there at all. So that's what it looks like. Um, one more piece of information you might want. What about the z-axis? You might want to know, where does the z-axis intersect my surface? So the z-axis is the point where x equals 0 and y equals 0. If that's the case, you get z squared equals k. So z equals plus or minus root k. Remember, k is positive. So then when you intersect the z-axis, you get these two points, z equals k and positive root k and negative root k. So you get actually points there. OK. OK, good. So there's just the one more case to consider. What if um, k is negative? Then we get uh, z squared. Okay, c squared equals x squared plus y squared minus k. So if we set x equal to 0 or y equal to 0, um, let's see, we get z squared equals y squared minus k or z squared equals x squared minus k. These are still hyperbolas. Um, setting z equal to 0, we get 0 equals this whole left-hand side, or moving the k over. k equals x squared plus y squared. So we do get ellipses. So when z equals 0, we do get an ellipse this side. It's, this time it's not empty. It's an ellipse. We could try other numbers. What if z is just some other positive constant, or just some constant at all? Then we would get z, c squared plus k equals x squared plus y squared. So again, ellipses. So for any horizontal slice, we get an ellipse. So every horizontal slice is an ellipse. <sighs> yep. And then um, that was interesting. Good. How about, again, we try the z-axis. So the z-axis is when x equals 0 and y equals 0. So we get z squared equals negative k. Solutions? No solutions. No solutions. So this tells us that the z-axis doesn't intersect our shape at all. So if we put this all together, um, what we will get is, let's see, first of all, um, horizontal cross sections are ellipses. So we have maybe an ellipse up here, an ellipse, an ellipse down here. And then vertical cross sections are hyperbolas. So we get this guy. And then other ones, we might get the one in the front and the back. And um, other, all the rest of the ellipses are here too. And then if we try to see where the z-axis is, 
it goes right through the middle of our shape without touching the surface at all. So because um, cross sections of both of these guys are hyperbolas, these are both called hyperboloids. So this is a hyperboloid, and that's a hyperboloid. But you want to emphasize that they're different. So this one is called a two-sheeted hyperboloid. So this is a two-sheeted hyperboloid. And this guy is a one-sheeted hyperboloid. So for each of these, we did pretty much the same thing. We checked when x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. If one of them seemed to be interesting, then we tried other constants other than 0 to sort of figure out what was going on. And sometimes we might want to check the z-axis or maybe the x-axis if it's in some other direction, something like that, to see where it intersects our shape. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the reason that we know that the z-axis goes right through the um, the center of her shape is because we're trying to preserve the symmetry, right? Like, how do we know that the z-axis isn't shifted a little bit to the right or left and not touching the surface of the sun? Yeah, I guess, uh, a priori, we wouldn't know that the z-axis was right in the middle of our shape. Okay. Because um, it potentially could have been a little bit to the right or to the left as long as it doesn't touch the surface of her shape, right? That's right. It, c it could have been anywhere as long as it didn't touch the surface. In fact, if we'd had an ellipsoid that was somehow far away from the origin, maybe the z-axis wouldn't have been inside it either. Um, but here, our ellipses um, have z, have x, uh, x equals 0, comma y equals 0 inside them. So the z-axis is inside there, our ellipses. Yeah, good question. OK. OK. So now I'd encourage you to think of these not as like individual things that you have to memorize. You could memorize what you get for different values of x and y and z and k and when you have a plus here and minus here, you can, you can memorize them. Um, but I think it's nice to, to s just sort of figure them out by looking at different slices. Um, and I'd encourage you to see these as a family. So I've said it's a family by saying we start at k equals 0, k greater than 0, k less than 0. But now I'm going to draw it like a movie. Um, I try to think of things in terms of how they change when you change things. So I think of a lot of things in terms of like the movie that you get when you vary different parameters. So here's what you get. Um, suppose you had like k equals a negative big number, and then k is a negative small number, and then k equals 0, and then k is a positive small number and then k is a positive big number. Well, let's see. When k is negative, we get a one-sheeted hyperboloid. And the bigger k is, so the further out it is, like the bigger the ellipses are. So when k is a negative big number, we get um, a kind of a far out one-sheeted hyperboloid. Then when k is a negative small number, we get one that's uh, sort of closer in. And then when k is 0, this thing has come all the way in and pinched. So we get a cone. And then when k is a positive small number, this pinch has pulled up so that there's space for that z equals 0 plane in the middle. And then when k is a positive big number, it's pulled even further away. So this is supposed to be like still frames from a movie. Can you see the one-sheeted hyperboloid getting smaller and smaller and smaller and then pinching and then contracting away like this as k changes? Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, and you can even see these. You could see these as um, level surfaces of a big function. So suppose our big function we're like, let's see, what is it exactly? It's z squared minus x squared minus y squared. And we're setting it equal to different constants called k. So this is like our function f of x, y, z. And we're setting it d d equal to different constants k. So we have our different level surfaces. When k is a big negative number, we have this picture. 
And then when k is 0, I'll just skip the middle one. When k is 0, we get our cone here. And then uh, when k is a positive number, we get these guys. So they're sort of like they're level surfaces for this big function when we set k equal to different constant values. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. See you next time.